So I want to take you back uh, to 2008. At that time, I was living in the United Kingdom, in, in England. I'd lived, lived there for about 10 years. And on February 26th of 2008, a study that my colleagues and I had done on antidepressant medication was published. It's, called a, it's a kind of study called a meta-analysis. It's a fancy term for a very simple thing, basic conceptually. It's just you take the data from a whole bunch of studies that have been done on a particular topic, and you put them together. One study will tell you something, three studies tell you more. The more studies you have, the more it tells you, but you have to have some way of putting it together. And you do that with what's called a meta-analysis. So that came out on... 26th of February, 2008. And I woke up that morning to find that it had become front-page news on, in all of the major UK daily newspapers. Two years later, it was still making news with a five-page cover story in Newsweek. And two years after that, on 60 Minutes, the following was aired. The medical community is at war, battling over the scientific research and writings of a psychologist named Irving Kirsch. The fight is about antidepressants, and Kirsch is questioning of whether they work. Somehow, I had been transformed <laughs> from a mild-mannered university professor <laughs> to a media-hyped superhero or supervillain, depending on whom it was you asked. What had my colleagues and I done to deserve that notoriety? Well, to tell you that story, we have to go back even further to 1998, when we published our first meta-analysis on antidepressants. And what I have to tell you about that was in 1998, when we did our first meta-analysis, I had no real interest in antidepressants or in evaluating antidepressants at all. I was interested in the placebo effect. I've always been interested in the placebo effect. How is it that a pill with no active ingredient, or an injection or whatever, with no active ingredient, can uh, produce the kind of changes that you sometimes see uh, with placebo? You might say I was addicted to placebo research, and I, I tried to kick the habit. I went to Placebos Anonymous, <laughs> where the first step was to admit that I really didn't have a problem at all. But it didn't work. I just couldn't stop researching the placebo effect. It was just too fascinating. You know, it's just a strange and wonderful phenomenon. Here's a few things you might want to know about the placebo effect that perhaps you already know, but perhaps you don't. Because there are all kinds of things that shape the placebo effect. For example, the placebo effect can depend on the color of the pill. Here's what we know, that blue pills have a much better sedative effect than either red or orange pills. And red pills have a much better stimulant effect than blue pills. And if you want pain relief, you're best off also having a red pill. It does better than a white, blue, or green <laughs> pill. Same lack of ingredients, just the color of the pill. The dose makes a difference. Two placebo pills are more effective than one placebo pill. And four placebo pills are more effective than two. When we do placebo studies with pills, we usually say that you need to take two pills twice a day. Very effective dose. The strength of the medication that you think you are getting makes a difference. So, placebo morphine, that is, a placebo pill that's labeled morphine is more effective than placebo aspirin, much more effective. And if it has a brand name, it's more effective than it's if, if it's a generic. Of course it is. 
The drug companies know that and they count on that. Why else would you spend more money for a brand name when you can get what's chemically the exact same thing in a generic? The price makes a difference. A more expensive placebo is more effective than a cheaper placebo. You tell the person, this placebo, you know, this costs the prescription and outside of this study it costs uh, $10 a pill or it costs $1 a pill. You get a stronger placebo effect when it's more expensive. The mode of administration. What do I mean by that? A placebo capsule is more effective than a placebo pill. A placebo injection is more effective than a placebo capsule. And surgery, that's the most effective placebo at all. And you might say, oh, he's kidding with that. But there have been trials of surgical procedures that have involved sham surgery, placebo surgery. The first going all the way back to the 1950s when they used to do a procedure called mammary ligation. And what they would do would be to um, cut open the patient and tie off the mammary artery and that's going to change the blood flow to the heart and that's going to help relieve an angina. And in fact, it had about an 80% success rate. And everybody assumed it was a nice, a good surgical pr procedure, but there were uh, two research labs around the same period of time, I believe it was the late 1950s, in two different locations that had some doubts. And they wondered whether this might be a massive placebo effect. And so what they did is they designed clinical trials. They both got published in the same year, but with different sets of subjects, different data, where they looked at um, one group being given the real mammary ligation surgery, the other group being given the sham surgery. What was the outcome? The real surgery produced 73% improvement. The sham surgery produced 83% improvement. I, I can't say with this one that the sham surgery was better than the real surgery because that difference was not statistically significant. They were basically both the same, and they don't do mammary ligation anymore. And you might wonder, is it ethical to have placebo surgery in a clinical trial? It's a very difficult question. Take people, you cut them open, and you sew them back up again. Now, what you should know is that's done with informed consent, so the people know that they might be getting the sham um, uh, surgery, or they might be getting the real surgery. One of the things you have to think about is what the ethical consequences would have been, been had they not done these studies. We would still be doing placebo surgery on hundreds of thousands of people with no one, not the patients and not the doctors, and no one knowing that it was a sham procedure and that the procedure itself was not having any effect. Much, much later, <clears throat> This was about, uh, I'd say about 15 years ago. A study was done on a procedure called arthroscopic surgery for osteoarthritis of the knee. Again, a procedure that had, was deemed to be very effective. And again, there were some physicians and researchers in Texas who had some doubts about it. And so they designed a clinical trial in which one group of patients got the real surgery and another group they opened up the knee, they closed it back up again. They made all the noises as if they were doing the surgery. The patients didn't know which was which. Two weeks after the surgery was done, people who had gotten the placebo surgery were doing significantly better. Now I can say it's better than those getting the real surgery. The it was on, on, on things like being able to walk up and down stairs. Um, they thought, well, maybe it's because these people had been spared the surgical uh, trauma, maybe. One year later, the placebo surgery still outperformed the real surgery by a small degree, statistically significant. It was a large study. Two years later, a two-year follow-up, no significant differences between 
the two groups. There is no advantage to the surgical procedure of arthroscopic surgery beyond the placebo effect. Now, people get better. And as you can see from the two-year follow-up, that lasts, the improvement lasts. But it's not the surgical procedure. It's the powerful placebo made more powerful because it's, oh, it's surgery. This is a real thing. And then there's a the condition being treated. Placebos are not panaceas. They don't work for everything. If you compare placebos to antibiotics for bacterial infections, none of the benefit is a placebo effect. Placebos do not have any impact at all on bacterial infections. They have a pretty good effect on pain. About half of the effect of a pain reliever, whether it be morphine or aspirin, um, is due to the placebo effect. You can get it with the placebo, you get about half. So remember, morphine is more effective than aspirin. Placebo morphine is more effective than placebo aspirin. Depression. As it turns out, as we now know, about 80% of the effects of antidepressant medication are duplicated when you give people a placebo in the clinical trials. And I'm going to argue that even that 20% difference may also be a placebo effect, but we'll get to that. Well, as I said, back when I started this research, I wasn't interested in the antidepressant effect. I was interested in the placebo effect, and it occurred to me that depression was a place where you ought to find a reliable and robust and relatively large placebo effect. Why? One of the core features of depression is a sense of hopelessness. If you're depressed, almost by definition, you're hopeless. You're feeling hopeless. And what are depressed people hopeless, feeling hopeless about? Some of them, many depressed people, are feeling hopeless about many things in their lives, but including their own depression. They don't feel they will ever get better. And that's depressing, because depression is really awful. And so it stands to reason that if you give someone a treatment that gives the promise that this will help you get better, that's going to counteract the hopelessness. That can lead to a sense of hopefulness and thereby help diminish the symptoms of depression. So we said, well, that's a good place to look at the placebo effect. We weren't interested in the drug effect. We knew the drug worked. We thought we did. the drug worked. I knew at that time that antidepressants were effective. I had no reason to doubt it. In addition to being a professor of psychology at the University of Connecticut at that time, I also had a clinical practice. I saw depressed patients, clients. If they were very, very depressed, I sometimes referred to them to psychiatric colleagues. I'm a psychologist, I could not prescribe medications, but I had colleagues who could, and I would say, you know, it might help. Oh, I'm so sorry I ever did that. I have to apologize to all of them. I said, but I didn't know any better. I said, you know, it might help to get you started, to help start your progress with an antidepressant, which has been shown to reduce depression, and then we can work on some of the issues that have led you to be depressed. Seemed like a reasonable thing to do, and sometimes it didn't work, didn't seem to help at all. Other times, they'd come back and they were doing better and I assumed that this, when they were doing better, that this was due to the antidepressant drug. So I wasn't that interested in evaluating it, but here I can look at it. We looked for um, clinical trials in which depressed people had either been randomized to get a placebo or been put on a waiting list, no treatment at all. They'll get treatment later for the benefit of this particular trial. We want to 
compare what happens when uh, nothing is done. You're put on a waiting list, which is not nothing. But Now, where are we going to find clinical trials in which people have been depressed, patients have been assigned to get a placebo? Only one place, the drug trials. So we had those data. We had the drug data, and so we analyzed them as well. When you are a researcher, you have data, you analyze it. See what it's telling you. And what I'm showing you on this slide now is the difference be in depression between before they got the treatment and afterwards. In a group of clinical trials, there's a meta-analysis now based on the published literature, and on the right-hand side, it's the unit we use, standardized mean difference you don't have to worry about. I can just tell you that this is a good size effect in terms of pre to post improvement. People got better. Not everybody, some did, some didn't. Some got better very much, some not at all, some just a little bit. But on average, there was a fair amount of improvement on, for the people who were given the drug. There was also a lot of improvement for given, people who were put on placebo. And very little improvement among people who were put in a wait list. They didn't have this sense of hope this reassurance that they're going to get better. One way of looking at that is that 25% of the response to the drug would have occurred no matter what you did. That occurred without even getting a placebo. That was just natural history, spontaneous recovery. In a relatively short time, these are mostly trials for this uh, to eight weeks long. Most antidepressant efficacy trials are about that length. Another 50% of the response to the drug was due to getting that placebo pill. That was a real placebo effect. It's, we're looking at here is the difference between getting a placebo and doing nothing, being put on a wait list. So that's a real placebo effect. But here was what at that time was a surprise and a shock to me. That meant that only 25% of the response to the drug was a true drug effect. Only 25% could be linked to the chemicals in the drug. The rest you got in people who were given the placebo that had no active ingredient at all. And that seemed very small for a treatment that had been widely heralded as constituting a revolution in our management of depression. Before we published it, before we published it, we wondered, we said, you know, we must have done something wrong. Maybe, maybe some antidepressants are very effective and others are very ineffective, and by lumping all antidepressants together, maybe we've underestimated the effectiveness of the effective ones, of the good ones, and have overestimated the placebo effect. So we went back to the same studies we had just analyzed, and we looked at what drug, what kind of antidepressant had been used. Some were tricyclics, that's the older generation of antidepressants. Some were SSRIs, the most popular antidepressants today. There were other antidepressants in some of these trials. Same pattern. And then we found some of them involved drugs, active drugs, that were not antidepressants at all. Included in our set of studies were studies on the effects of lithium, which is used for bipolar disorder, not on bipolar patients, but on patients with unipolar depression. Bipolar is manic depression, uh, where you cycle between mania and, and depressive states. Others were studies of tranquilizers, barbiturates, benzodiazepines. Other, one was a study of a synthetic thyroid hormone given to depressed people who did not have a thyroid disorder. And what was the result of that? Same as the others. If you want to see how reliable it is, I'm going to express this placebo response, that's the darker red bar, as a percent of the drug response. And you'll see it's identical. Three quarters of the response to the drug was duplicated in the 
placebo condition, no matter what the drug was, even if it was a drug that's not an antidepressant. So the question is, what do all of these active drugs have in common that the placebos don't have? Any guess? Side effects, absolutely. Before we even talk about why it's important, just an example of what that means, if you look at the therapeutic benefits of this tricyclic antidepressant, imipramine, it's just like this is one particular study, and it, you can see that it's just like the data we show, found in our meta-analysis, just a little bit better than placebo. If you look at the side effects, it's a lot worse. Placebo is producing very few side effects. The imipramine, a lot more. Now, why is that important? Well, there's... The placebo has an evil twin, the placebo effect, and it's called the nocebo effect. <laughs> and just as thinking you are going to get better can lead you to get better, thinking you're going to get worse can lead you to get worse. So a placebo can produce some side effects if you think you're getting the real drug and it's, it, it, it's going to give you these side effects. But the there, with antidepressants, at least, the nocebo effect, the side effects, are much, much, much smaller than the therapeutic effects. But why is that important? Why am I talking about that part of it? And what I have to ask you to do is imagine. Imagine that you ha are depressed, and, and I'm imagining it too, so, and, and we've been recruited to be subjects in a clinical trial for an antidepressant. Now, before the trial can begin, before they can begin treating us, we have to give informed consent. They have to inform us, and we have to consent to be part of the study, sign it on a dotted line. And in that informed consent procedure, they tell us, this is a double-blind trial. You may get the active drug, you may get the placebo. And because it's double-blind, that's not what double-blind means, no. Yeah. What double-blind means <clears throat> is that we're not going to tell you. You won't know whether you're getting the active drug or the placebo, and the doctor won't know whether you're getting the active drug or the placebo. So that, in that sense, you're both being blinded to which group you're in. And you're told, now, the therapeutic effects may take some weeks before you notice them. And you're told, the active drug also has side effects. They don't take some weeks to be noticed. And you're told what the side effects are. You may experience dry mouth, nausea, sexual dysfunction, and there's a whole long list of side effects that you might experience from the active drug. And then you, you say, OK, I'm willing to do that. And you sign on the dotted line, and you see the psychiatrist, and you are given a pill. Now, I would wonder, which group am I in? I don't know. They didn't tell me. It's double blind. My mouth's getting dry. That's one of the side effects that they told me about that the active drug produces. That means that I'm in the active drug group. Hooray! I feel better already. You see, until I figure that out, say, okay, maybe I'm getting a, an active drug, maybe I'm getting a placebo. Once I figure it out, I know I'm getting the active drug. Isn't it likely that the placebo is going to have a larger effect once I think that I know which group I'm in? Here's what we know about these clinical trials of antidepressants. Both the doctors and the patients break blind, and that means can figure out, under certain conditions, which group they're in. What do I mean by certain conditions? If you ask, it's rarely done. It should be done in every single clinical trial. It should be required to be done in every single clinical trial. It's very rarely done, but in some trials, they have asked patients, what do you think you were given, the drug or the placebo? And they asked the doctor, what do you think this patient was given, the drug or the placebo? And here's one of the few clinical trials where they did that. And what you ought to get, if it's just 
they really don't know, if they don't have no ideas, you ought to get about a 50% accuracy rate, right? And for patients in the placebo group, that's just what you get, about a 50% accuracy rate. So 68% of them actually in this study said, 59% said, oh, I, I, if you make me guess, I'll say I'm in the, I'm, I'm in the placebo group. And, 49%, well, I think I'm in the drug group. They really didn't know. But for the patients in the drug condition who'd been given the real drug, nine out of 10 of them said, oh, I've been given the real drug. How did they know? I think they knew because they got side effects. The doctors can even tell which groups are, which patients are in the placebo as well as which pa patients are in the active drug group. Amazingly accurate. It's supposed to be double blind, it's really double talk. <laughs> patients in the drug group know they're getting the active drug, which is likely to boost their confidence, increase their hopefulness, get a bigger decrease in their hopelessness, and thereby give them a, therape a therapeutic benefit. And I don't have to just speculate about that because we have some data on that. And these are clinical trials. These are all the clinical trials. Out of the thousands that have been done, these are the only ones in which they ask people, what are you on? And what you see plotted on the left-hand side are the patient's responses, and on the right-hand side are the doctor's responses, the raters, the people who are rating how depressed they are before and after the trial. And what you see on the vertical axis is the effect, the amount of difference between drug and placebo, with that horizontal line being no difference at all. And what you'll see is the more, ac the more people think they're on the drug condition, the more accurate they are in guessing the more they break blind, the bigger the difference between drug and placebo. So what are these drug-placebo differences that we looked at in, in our clinical trials? Where you get this relatively small but difference between drug and placebo, but you do get a statistically significant difference. You might think of antidepressants as extra strength placebos as opposed to ordinary placebos in these trials. You're getting a placebo effect that's magnified by the knowledge that you're getting a real drug compared to thinking you might be getting a placebo. So we published those data in 1998 and we titled our article, Listening to Prozac but Hearing Placebo. Since then, since then, I have shifted the focus of my, well, I still do a lot of research in placebo. I can't get away from it. I really do love the placebo effect. But I also now am interested in evaluating antidepressants. And we published this first meta-analysis. And one of the critics in a published response to it said, your analysis is flawed. It derives from a minuscule group of unrepresentative, inconsistently and erroneously selected articles. He was saying, look, you haven't looked enough, at enough of the studies. If you looked at more studies, you'd find out that the difference is a lot bigger than you say it is. Well, what are we going to do? A colleague that I'd never met before wrote to me in, uh, from Washington, D.C. and said, you know, I've read your study. And I've read the criticisms of it, and I've got a suggestion for you. Why don't you replicate it with a whole different set of studies? See if you get the same result. And I even have a suggestion to you as to what studies you should use. What you should do is use the Freedom of Information Act. Go to the FDA and have them send you the data from all of the clinical trials that the drug companies have sent to them in the process of getting their drugs approved and their application for drug approval. I said, that's a great idea. Let's do it together. You're in Washington. Get the studies. Send them to me. Keep a copy for yourself. I'll analyze it with my graduate students at the University of Connecticut. 
you do your analysis at your university. Well, that way we can check on each other and make sure that nobody's making a mistake, and we'll see what we find. And so Tom Moore was his name. Tom did that, and he got the clinical trial data from the FDA on what at that time were the sixth most widely prescribed antidepressant medications. Now, the data that the FDA has in its files is a very important and special data set. For one thing, it's the basis upon which the drugs have been approved. So if anyone says, well, and I, this is what has happened ever after publishing our analyses of the FDA data, people said, well, these trials really aren't good trials. Okay, if they're not good trials, then the drugs should never have been improved, approved at all. You're supposed to approve drugs where you've shown them to be effective, not when your trial wasn't good enough to be able to find them effective. Second, it includes all, all of the trials that the FDA deemed to have been adequate and well-controlled. And that all is very important because, as it turns out, 40%, 40% of the clinical trials done by the drug companies, submitted to the FDA, were never published. Do you know why they weren't published? This might give you a hint. If you look at the published trials, three out of four of them show a statistically significant difference between drug and placebo. If you look at the unpublished trials, that figure drops to 12%. But now we had the data from the published trials, and we had the data from the unpublished trials, and we can put them all together and look at all of them and see what we can find. And they all now are using the same measure of depression. It's called the Hamilton Depression Inventory, Hamilton's Rating Scale for Depression because that's what the FDA was requiring. Um, and you get what on the Hamilton Depression scale is a reasonably a respectable improvement in people given the drug. And in people given placebo, you get a reasonably respectable clinical improvement. And now 82% of the response to the drug is being duplicated by the inactive placebo. The difference, that difference on the Hamilton scale is a difference of 1.8 points. That's on a scale. To make that sense of it, it doesn't make any, what does that mean, you know, unless you know the scale. It's a scale on which scores can range from 0 to 53 points. You can get a six-point difference just by changes in sleep patterns without changes in any other symptom of depression. A 1.8 different point difference, less than two points, is clinically meaningless. And you don't have to just take my word for it. There is an organization in the United Kingdom called the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. Their acronym is NICE, and they are a very nice organization. What they do is that they establish treatment guidelines for the National Health Service in, in England. And in 2004, they proposed, looked at all the data, and they proposed uh, a cutoff, a criterion. How large does a difference between a drug and a placebo response have to be in order to be clinically meaningful? clinically significant. And they said, well, it should be at least three points. And as you see, on the Hamilton Depression scale, as you can see, the actual data is considerably lower than that. Now, I should pause to clarify one thing, because these two concepts can easily be confused, and the difference is very important. The difference between statistical significance and clinical significance. Because my contention is, and the data tell us very clearly, that although the difference between drug and placebo is statistically significant, it's not clinically significant. It's not clinically 
meaningful. You see, statistical significance tells you whether an effect is real or not, whether it's reliable, whether you would get it again if you did the study again. What are the odds you would get it again if you did uh, uh, the study again? It doesn't tell you how large it is. It doesn't tell you how meaningful it is in a person's life, what kind of difference it would make in their life. Clinical significance relates to how meaningful, how large is that change, how big a change is it, what would it make a difference to anybody that they would be worth spending some money on or risking side effects from. Imagine, here's an example, imagine a study has been done on 500,000 subjects, 500,000 people, and has found that smiling increases life expectancy by 10 seconds. With 500,000 subjects, I can virtually guarantee you that that difference is going to be statistically significant. Clinically meaningful? Who cares, right? So we published those data back in 2002, and the critics said, the patients in those trials weren't depressed enough. What? <laughs> so yeah, sure, you see, if, if you're dealing with mildly depressed or moderately depressed patients, <clears throat> they'll respond to anything. You won't get much of a drug placebo difference at all. But the people we see in clinical practice, they're severely depressed. And with severely depressed patients, that's where you see a meaningful difference. That's where you would see, if you didn't done the studies, a meaningful difference in between drug and placebo. So how are we going to counter that? I mean, that's possible, right? So we went back to the data that we had gotten from the FDA, and we looked at how depressed were the patients before being given the drug or placebo. And here's what we found. There, was only, there were no trials on mildly depressed people at all. There was one trial on people who had baseline before being given the treatment were moderately depressed. That trial showed absolutely zero difference between drug and placebo. There were no trials on severely depressed patients. All of the rest of the patients were very severely depressed. And they also did not cross this cutoff that had been proposed by NICE. We did find that if you went on the very extreme end of severity, there were a small number of studies with extremely, with the American Psychiatric Association classification, they don't go beyond very severe. But within the very severe, there was a group of small studies with extremely very severe depression. And if you looked at their data, you did see it cross that boundary. It's still a small difference on a scale where you can get a six-point difference just by changes in sleep, but it did cross the boundary that had been proposed by NICE. What does that mean? This, if you take all the people who come into clin uh, clinics and are diagnosed with major depressive disorder, this is the distribution, what you're seeing on this slide is the distribution of severity. And what you'll see is this point at which the data seem to get, show clinical significance People had to be depressed at a level that represents about one-tenth, in this case, 11% of the depressed population who are being prescribed antidepressants. That means nine out of 10 people would not show a benefit from the chemical in the drug. And that is on the assumption that the people you're giving the drug to are all depressed. But here's another thing that you should know about antidepressants. When you give a drug to someone for whom the drug has been approved, that's one thing. Doctors also give drugs for purposes that the drug has not been approved, and that's called off-label prescribing. So I've seen antidepressants prescribed for insomnia, even though it's a side effect of the SSRIs, for stress, for death of a pet dog, for lumbar muscle spasms, 
Antidepressants get doled out like candy by some treating physicians, by general practitioners, people who aren't even psychiatrists, patients who have come in, they have no psychiatric complaints at all. Here's a study of how much that happens. In this study, they looked at patients who are currently being prescribed antidepressants. And the question was, what percentage of those patients had ever qualified for a diagnosis, ever in their life qualified for a diagnosis of major depressive disorder? What was the lifetime of incidence of depression, clinical depression, in people who are currently taking antidepressant medication? The answer is 31%. 69% have never been clinically depressed in their lives. Now, they're also prescribed for anxiety disorders. 38% of them had at some time in their life been uh, qualified for the diagnosis of an anxiety disorder. Almost 40%, almost 4 in 10, had never suffered from a clinical depression or an anxiety disorder. Why does that numbers don't add up exactly? It's because some people had suffered from both. So that's being taken into account in that bar on the right. 38%, almost 4 in 10 people, currently taking antidepressants, have never, never suffered from clinical depression or an anxiety disorder. And by the way, antidepressants are no better for anxiety disorders than they are for depression. So we published those data in 2008, and the critics said, well, the patients were too depressed. Oh, give me a break. What were the editors of Nature Review's drug discovery thinking of when they leveled that criticism? Well, they pointed out, take a look at your data. You've got at least one trial with moderately depressed patients, and then you've got trials with very severely depressed patients, but you don't have any trials in the FDA data set on patients who are severely depressed. Not very severely, but more depressed than moderately depressed. Maybe they're the ones who really would show the benefit of antidepressants. I guess they were hypothesizing that the curve would look something like that. Can you see that white line? Yeah, I call it the, the Loch Ness Monster Hypothesis. Well, what are we going to do now? I, that didn't seem very plausible to us, but I guess it's possible that that's the way it works. We'd have to go out and find some new studies because there weren't any studies like that in the, in the FDA data set of the six drugs we had looked at. Fortunately, we didn't have to go out and do anything because an excellent group of researchers at the University of Pennsylvania did an independent replication of our study, of our meta-analyses. They had, what we had were means and standard deviations from the FDA summary data. And that's what meta-analysis usually use. They had something even better. They had the raw data, the patient-level data, patient by patient, in six clinical trials. And they looked at what, how, mild, how severely were the patients depressed at baseline before being given either the drug or placebo. And some of them were mildly depressed, and some were moderately, and some were severely, and some very severely. And then if you looked at the very extreme end of very severely, they got exactly the same thing that we found. Can't imagine a better replication. So then the critics said, well, the nice criteria, the cutoff, the three-point difference for clinical significance, for clinical meaningfulness, that's arbitrary. And they're right. It's arbitrary. It's as arbitrary as the criteria we use for statistical significance, which is five times in a hundred that could occur by chance. It's as arbitrary of the, as the criteria we use for deciding whether a person has responded to treatment, which is a 50% reduction in symptoms. It's as arbitrary as uh, what we use for deciding when someone is no longer depressed which is the score on the Hamilton Depression Inventory of seven or less. They're all arbitrary criteria, and so is the nice, so is the nice criterion. 
So the question is, what would a non-arbitrary criterion be? And the answer is, we found one. Now this is probably going to be the hardest one to explain, so bear with me and I'll try and walk you through this slowly. This is a study that was done two years ago by a group of researchers that had access to 43 trials involving more than 7,000 patients, and they had the raw patient-level data. And on those trials, everybody had been rated on a scale called the clinical global impression of improvement. And on that scale, the treating clinician who has seen the patient at the beginning and throughout the trial doling out the medication or placebos, presumably supposedly double blind, rates the patient as being, at the end of the trial, being very much worse, much worse, minimally worse, no change at all, minimally improved, much improved, very much improved. And for each of these patients, we also had, they also had, Leucht and his colleagues also had, change scores on the Hamilton Depression Inventory. How much of the patients uh, improved on average? So here's what they plotted, and here's what we're going to look at now. What's the average change on the Hamilton for people who, whose doctors say this person's very much worse, or much worse, or minimally worse, or this person hasn't changed at all, and so on? Here's what you get for people getting worse, but here's the important one. No change. You would think that no change should mean there's zero change on the Hamilton Depression Scale, right? In fact, the mean change score of people on the Hamilton Depression Scale whose clinicians had rated them as not having changed at all in their depression was three points. A three-point improvement on the Hamilton coincided with clinicians saying, I don't see any change in this patient at all. If anything, the NICE criterion was too liberal. It led to rating as clinically significant a change that clinicians, treating clinicians, can't even detect as a change at all. Here would be, a, if you want a meaningful cutoff you should look at what, how much change do you need for the clinician to say that this person's at least minimally better, right? Just minimally. You would need a seven-point change on the Hamilton. Nobody ever gets that. Nobody ever gets that. Now we look at our data again with criteria that are not arbitrary at all. And what we find is even the most depressed patients do not have a level of change on the Hamilton that would come close to a doctor saying, well, this person's gotten a little better. They can't detect the difference. The critic's last resort, I call it the true believer hypothesis. Here's what one very famous psychopharmacologist wrote. Antidepressants work. Everybody knows they work. And another critic wrote, clinical practice plus millions of content patients can't be that wrong. Well, the history of medicine is replete with treatments that have worked for millions of content patients. And here are just a few of them. And that's why we don't rely on patient testimonials in deciding on clinical treatments. Instead, we do clinical trials. And when we do clinical trials, everybody gets the same results. Here are the results of six different meta-analyses, some by my harshest, most severe critics who said he must have gotten it wrong, and so they did their own, and that's what they get. I've left out the last, saving the last for best. The last, 2015, I've been shown and given permission to report the data on, on this study hasn't been published yet. Um, 
This is a study done by a senior statistician and a clinical evaluator at FDA using the FDA data from more than 23,000 patients in 92 clinical trials on file with the FDA. And here's what they found. The exact same difference that we had found back in 2002. Here's how the FDA's director of psychiatric products evaluation, former, he's, he retired about a year or so ago, had to say in 60 Minutes about that. The data that we have shows that the drugs are effective. But what about the degree of effectiveness? I think we all agree that the, the changes that you see in the short-term trials, the difference between improvement in drug and placebo is rather small. I love the look on Leslie Saul's face <coughs> when he says that. We all agree the difference in improvement between drug and placebo is rather small. In fact, it's so small that it's not even detectable by a treating clinician. To not see it, you have to bury your head in the sand like an ostrich or a drug company sales rep. And it doesn't matter which antidepressant you take. We first saw that, and you saw that slide from my first meta-analysis, 1998, when we looked at different classes of drugs, including drugs that weren't antidepressants, and the difference between drug and placebo was identical virtually identical, regardless of the class of drug. Maybe, yeah, they're all the same, but maybe, see, maybe some people who benefited from the, the, the SSRIs wouldn't have benefited from the tricyclics and verse, vice versa. So you, maybe you have to find the right drug for the right person, and what you're looking at data where some people have gotten the drug they need, and some people have a different thing wrong with them in their brain, so they didn't get what they need. And what you need to do, and what we do in clinical practice, is if the first drug doesn't work, we switch to a different antidepressant. See, and that's the way you get it to really work well. This is a meta-analysis published in 2010, in which they evaluated that hypothesis. They looked at clinical trials, in which people who had not responded to an antidepressant were either given a different antidepressant or kept on the same antidepressant, double blind, and this time I believe that blind was kept because there's side effects to both, double blind, so they don't know whether they're getting a different antidepressant or getting the same anti being kept on the same antidepressant. And here's what they find. Someone doesn't respond to an antidepressant, you switch them to another antidepressant, 34% of them then improved. Someone doesn't respond to an antidepressant, you keep them on to the same antidepressant, 40% of them <laughs> improve. It doesn't matter. Here are improvement rates in cl clinical trials in which people are, they're head-to-head -head trials. An antidepressant is compared to some other, anti, some other type of antidepressant, SSRIs, NDRIs, SSRI serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. NDRIs, uh, norepinephrine dopamine reuptake in, inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, benzodiazepine, a tranquilizer. Same response rate, doesn't matter. And that's not considering a drug called tianeptine. Tianeptine is, has been approved by the French regulators as an antidepressant. It's marketed in France prescribed in a number of other countries as well. It's unlike most antidepressants that we have. Most antidepressants are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. And they're also a selective uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, also all of them, both of those are supposed to increase the amount of serotonin in the brain by decreasing the rate of reuptake into the, into the cells. That's the way they're supposed to work. Tianeptine is an SSRE. It's a selective serotonin reuptake enhancer. It's supposed to do the exact opposite of what the SSRI is supposed to do. If increasing serotonin in the brain makes you better, then Tianeptine ought to make you worse. What do the data show?
You remember that slide? Just showed it to you a minute ago. Now we'll add in the tianeptine data. It doesn't matter. What do you call pills, the effect of which are independent of their chemical composition? I call them placebos, and they should be taken with a grain of salt. <laughs> How did these drugs get approved? The FDA knew these data. Here are the FDA approval. Here's the FDA approval criterion. You have to have two clinical trials showing a statistically significant difference between drug and placebo. There are no limits to the number of trials that you can conduct. You can condu you, maybe you need to conduct 10 trials in order to get two that show a statistically significant difference. That's okay. 50% of the trials, in fact, are negative. Negative trials don't count. And clinical significance is not considered. It's treated as irrelevant. So how, then, should depression be treated? Well, one thing that's been suggested is prescribe antidepressants as active placebos. After all, the, the, the placebo effect is large, and you, know, you can't give people placebos and tell them you, you, giving them placebos won't work, work. You can't lie to them because that's unethical. I believe it's unethical. I believe in the autonomy of people who are going to see clinicians. They shouldn't be lied to. Uh, lied to. But, you know, these are active medications. That's true, they are. And if they evoke the placebo effect, and that's primarily what they're doing, that might be an ethical way of getting the placebo effect. And, of course, the problem is you have to weigh the benefits against the risks. The benefits are negligible. Side effects include sexual dysfunction, long-term weight gain, insomnia, diarrhea, nausea, anorexia, bleeding, forgetfulness, and down the list. And I present these data to doctors, and they say, no, no, 70 to 80 percent sexual dysfunction. I've now seen, actually, estimates over 90 percent. Here are the actual data. That's the amount of treatment emergent sexual dysfunction. That is, sexual dysfunction developing after being given treatment. Here it is with the red circle on uh, placebo. Here it is for SSRIs between 70 and 80 percent of patients getting treatment emergent sexual dysfunction, not having had sexual dysfunction before, but being sexually dysfunctional after being put on the drug. And these are essentially ad addictive drugs. 30 percent of people trying to get, you know, I've seen estimates, 30 to 50 percent of people trying to get off them experience a withdrawal syndrome. And it's not just, it's not just the patient who experiences it. If a woman is taking antidepressants in pregnancy. 30% of the neonates born to women who were taking antidepressants show a neonatal abstinence syndrome, which includes things like a high-pitched cry, sleep disturbance, tremors, gastrointestinal disturbance. The exact same abstinence syndrome shown by the neonates the babies born to mothers who are on amphetamines, barbiturates, benzodiazepine, cocaine, morphine, and heroin. There are other health risks. In children and young adults, there's an increased risk of suicide. In the elderly, there's an increased risk of stroke and of death from all causes. In pregnant women, there's an increased risk of miscarriage. Babies born, an increased risk of babies being born with birth defects, uh, hypertension, autism. Among everyone, an increased risk of diabetes and an increased risk of relapse. And here's the other thing that people say, an increased risk of relapse. You've got to be kidding, although if you heard Robert Whitaker's excellent talk before this one, you'll know that the, uh, the data uh, on that are very clear. Here's one piece of data of that, on that, and that's a study done by the National Institute of Mental Health, a gigantic study, a collaborative research study um, comparing cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal psychotherapy, a tricyclic antidepressant, imipramine, and placebo. And here's the weight of relapse from people who had improved. There was no difference in improvement between these four groups. Among the mildly, moderately depressed patients, differences were non-existent. 
Relapse rates, however, significantly higher. There's about almost 20% of patients who would not relapse in any of the other treatments will relapse if they've been given an antidepressant. Here's another study, if that one's not enough for you. In this study, people were either given an SSRI, an antidepressant, or put on an exercise program, or given both. Maybe the two together will work better than one alone. Four-month remission rates, excellent. Really, I think, unusually good. And no difference between the groups. Relapse on the SSRI, close to 40%. On the exercise program, only 8%. Well, what about if you put the two together, the exercise and the SSRI? Goes way back up again. Adding an SSRI to the exercise program, the exercise program quadrupled the rate of relapse. Well, is exercise a placebo? Could be, but consider the side effects of antidepressants, and then think about the side effects of exercise. Which placebo would you rather have? Maybe we should prescribe placebos. Well, again, there's the ethical problem about lying to people, and then we think that if the received wisdom is that if you know it's a placebo, it won't work, although there are actually some data suggesting that may not be the case, but I won't get into that now. Fortunately, we don't have to, because almost all, there are many alternatives. There are many alternatives. These are the ones that have been subject to the most data, most clinical trials. Here's what you get in terms of average symptom reduction on antidepressants and on placebo. And so what you want is something that at least performs as well as placebo, hopefully a little bit better at least, being put on a waiting list. That's the worst thing you can do. Standard care, which often involves antidepressants, no better than placebo. Psychotherapy, a little bit better. About the same as the antidepressant. Put the two together, psychotherapy and antidepressant, no benefit beyond giving either one alone. Exercise, same thing. Acupuncture, same thing. So, and I suspect many other things. Meditation, we know mind, mindfulness is not in that data set, but mindfulness meditation, they're good data. Uh, so how should we decide about treatments? Well, when treatments are equally effective, prescribe the safest. And that's certainly not going to be an antidepressant. When they're equally safe, prescribe what the person wants. Let the patient choose. Well, we know if you give patients a choice between antidepressant and psychotherapy, three out of four would choose the psychotherapy, given the choice. So we don't have to prescribe placebos, but I wish we could. I love placebos. I told you that. I was addicted to placebo research, and I once had a dream. It was while I was back in the UK. I, in my dream, I dreamed that I'd woken up in the morning and opened my favorite UK daily newspaper. It's actually called The Independent. I put The Independent there. And I read that placebos had been approved by the FDA in doses ranging from 1 to 40,000 milligrams. And I was really I was happy. I was so delighted when I woke up and, and it was about that dream. And I, and I thought, gee, wouldn't that be great? And if we could prescribe placebos, we could also advertise them. You can't advertise drugs in the UK. This is one of the few countries where you can. Uh, but, you know, we could advertise. And I wondered, what would a placebo advertisement look like? And I imagined it would look something like this. Prevaricane, a genuine placebo treatment, tested in more clinical trials than any other treatment. So powerful, it's the standard by which all medications are tested. So effective, it's used in the treatment of thousands of ailments. Safe enough to be given to infants, the elderly, and preg pregnant women. And I have to warn you, it may put you off medications that produce side effects. Remember, if it's a placebo, you can believe in it. <laughs> I'm about to conclude, and I thought I might conclude by reading a poem of Shakespeare's. But then I thought, why should I? He never reads any of mine. <laughs> Still, I, I, I just I can't resist this one. It's Shakespeare's Ode to Placebo. 
friends, placebans, Floridians, spare me your tears. I come to praise placebo, not to bury it. The evil doctors do lives after them. The good is often part placebo. The medical world's a stage, and placebos merely players. Each one plays a different part. This one Prozac, that one morphine, and nothing is true. But thinking makes it so. And I thank you. We've got about 10 minutes, and I'm open for questions. What's in a placebo? What's in a placebo? Do you know that's an excellent question? They usually don't say. They usually don't say. And so it, it, it can be cornstarch. Um, it, 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 can, it can be, uh, when it's an injection, it's usually saline. saline. Um, it should be innocuous. There are some cases when uh, you give, uh, it can be lactose, which is fine, I guess, for some things, but imagine if you're doing it for gut disorders, a treatment for gut disorders, and you have some people who are lactose intolerant, and the placebo has lactose. That'll give you a drug placebo difference, won't it? So it's actually, it should be required that people state what was in the placebo. That's a good, excellent question. Hi, I'm over here in the middle. Oh, yes. Hi. Uh, you didn't, you, later on, next session, you're going to be talking about uh, pharmaceuticals in general, not necessarily psychiatric ones. Yes. And uh, my question is to uh, the, the uh, medications uh, prescribed for, for epilepsy, you know, like lamictal and uh, phenobarbital. Uh, what do you think about those? What I have to say is come to the next session and ask one of the other panelists, because I have no idea. I haven't studied those data. And one of the things that I am very careful about, I need to be very careful about, is not to make any claims or evaluations unless I have studied the data well enough to feel that I can do so with confidence based on data, not based on my guess or what I've read casually. When I say something here, I want you to know that it is based on a careful and thorough evaluation of the data that I can back up easily and quickly. When I did that, I was very impressed, I have to say, with 60 Minutes. Um, there was a year preparing that story, and they did their homework. I've been interviewed for a lot of television documentaries and, and, and news shows, and I've never seen anything like this before or since. They were on the phone with me about once a week before the interview, and they would say things, um, look, we just saw there's this new study out, and it says, seems to say this, have you seen it? What do you think of that? And so-and-so from the FDA has said this to us. What do you think of that? And they would go back to the FDA. Kirsch said this. What do you think of that? And after they finished filming, until it aired, from the time they finished filming to the time it aired, every few weeks, I'd get a phone call from them. Some new data, some new studies have been published. They wanted to make sure that they could defend the statements that they made and the way they put the program together. They aired the program. The former head of the American Psychiatric Association did a, uh, made a statement saying it was irresponsible of them for, to, to have aired that segment, that Kirsch's research has been discredited. He didn't say by whom or where. Um, and the 60 Minutes replied, we stand by our story. So I was very impressed by them. Uh, I want to thank you for such a great presentation in demonstrating, without a doubt, you know, the placebo effect. But have you looked at, or anyone looking at, how does the placebo effect work? What is the workings of it? Is it worked on a belief system and thought? So there's other processes going on here that I feel that they're the ones, since the placebo effect is so good, why don't we find out actually how, to, how it works and make it work? 
Absolutely, and that's why I've been doing research on the placebo effect before I ever got into the field of, of antidepressants. I'm associate director of a group at Harvard called the uh, Program in Placebo Studies, and we are devoted to doing exactly that, to trying to take apart the placebo to understand how it works, and we are learning tremendous uh, amount. One thing which we're learning is that there's not just one placebo effect. There are many different placebo effects, and they work differently. So the way a we do brain imaging studies, for example, the way a, a placebo works for depression is different than the way it works for pain. And even within the same dis disorder, placebo morphine seems to work by the release of endogenous opioids in, in the brain. Placebo antisteroidal anti-inflammatories does not. It seems to work by uh, affecting cannabinoid receptors. So it's a complex, fascinating field. And what seems to happen is if you believe that something's going to happen, and if you've ever had an opiate, and, if, and I'm sure you've had a, a, an NSAID, you'll know you can feel the difference. And if you believe that something's going to happen in your experience, when you think it's going to happen, your brain does something that mimics what happens from the actual um, uh, drug. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we are looking at, and we have a long way to go. We are making strides. We know that there are two things that are involved. One is a person's beliefs and expectations. That's been very well demonstrated. And another is the therapeutic relationship. The relationship between a clinician and a client or pa patient, depending on the kind of setting it is, um, the better the therapeutic relationship. And we've actually been able to manipulate the therapeutic relationship in the placebo treatment of irritable bowel syndrome and found that if we enhance the therapeutic relationship, we enhance the effectiveness of treatment, and we can get a placebo effect with a good therapeutic relationship that's as good as the best, uh, the usually things like probiotics and things, and, and fiber uh, uh, treatments. They don't have very great treatments, and they acknowledge it. They're not defensive about it um, for irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. Sunshine. Sunshine, yeah. I don't know, I haven't seen, there haven't, there needs to be a lot more research done. You know, the drug companies do research on drugs. They're not interested in this evaluating alternatives, uh, drugs, drug uh, uh, clinical trials are expensive. The uh, National Institute of Health and some charitable organizations will fund research. They are, their research winds up showing a lot smaller effect for drugs than the drug company research does, which I find interesting. Um, but they will f fund research, and they funded some research into psychotherapy, but there is woefully little. There's, compared to the thousands and tens of thousands of patients who've been studied uh, in drug trials, one of the things that we need, we need education, we need people to understand how small the benefits are how the risks, uh, great the risks are, what the alternatives are, and we need financing for clinical trials into alternatives, and that would include things like sunshine. Question. Um, how, has it, how, how have your studies been received in England compared to this country? Oh, that's an excellent question as, uh, as well. Um, you know, it's controversial everywhere. That's the first thing I have to acknowledge, and there is a strong controversy, but NICE, when they did their 2004 guidelines, they looked at the two meta-analyses that I had done at that point, and they considered that, and they considered other data of that sort, and they came to a conclusion, and their conclusion was that, especially for moderately depressed patients, um, drugs should not be the frontline treatment and even for the very severely depressed patients, psychotherapy should be provided either as a complement or an alternative. And Lord Laird, who was at the, he's a Lord, it's not his first name, 
as at the London School of Economics did a um, cost-benefit analysis on antidepressants and psychotherapy and figured out that in the long run, it would be cheaper to provide short-term psychotherapy for people who are depressed than to give them antidepressant medication that they're going to have to be maintained on maybe for the rest of their lives. And so the British government passed legislation voted for by both the Tories and the Labour Party, that's very unusual, isn't it? In which they established a program to train 10,000 new therapists dedicated to treating um, depression with psychotherapy for free through the National Health Service. The initial reports on those, very impressive and positive. If you see the entire, if you, uh, if you would like to see the entire um, 60 minutes uh, segment, it's available both on YouTube and on the 60 minutes CBS website. Um, the YouTube one is I think a little easier. You, a couple steps you save, you click it on, it goes right on. And you will see there uh, a discussion by someone from the National Health Service in, uh, in the UK. And, his understanding of the research and the implication. Just put in, put in uh, Kirsch antidepressant. That'll do it. It'll come up very quick, very easily that way. Thank you all. And it's a pleasure being here. And I hope I'll see some of you in the panels later this evening. <laughs>